Okay, no need to introduce myself today. So I'm going to talk about SVD and PCA, the things that you're going to see everywhere. Also, you might not know that, you, that you're using them. Almost everything in numerical linear algebra today uses SVD. And a lot of people do exploratory analysis, like the first thing they do with their data, if it's high dimensional data, it's PCA. So when you have only one variable and like continuous one like this, which is like normal, then what are you going to do for the exploratory analysis? You're going to plot some things like histograms. Then you, you can say, OK, it looks symmetric. It looks like a normal distribution. Or you're going to plot box plots like here, which have median value here, interquartile ranges and everything. But that's only one variable, like height or something like that. What happens when you have two variables? You can do almost the same thing. You can plot histograms of variables separately. And you can print box plots of variables. But you can also print the joint distribution, like here. So you have more information. You can plot x and y and then try to see. So basically, this is a histogram. This is a density but with two-dimensional space below it. And this comes from normally distributed data, but in two dimensions. Now, if you have more data, as Athena was telling you 15 or 20 minutes ago, almost everybody nowadays works with huge amounts of data. And I just wrote here 10 variables, but it can be 10,000 variables. What are you going to do for the exploratory analysis? Are you going to plot one by one? Try to plot maybe 2D, 3D, maybe something like this. So people usually do this. You have your variables. And for example, this plot means it's variable 4 on the x-axis and variable 5 on the y-axis. So maybe if you don't have 10,000 variables, but only 10, 15, 30 maybe, you're going to plot things like this. And then you're going to see, OK, there is some kind of relationship here, 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 probably here. This is, of course, a symmetric plot. So if there is a relationship here, there should be there. It's just that you swap x and y axis. But it doesn't seem like a thing you're going to do or you want to do because it will take you for maybe 10 months just to take all the SNPs and trying to see what happens to the SNPs. So maybe you would like to plot it in a higher dimension. Maybe. But does anybody, is anybody here capable of looking at plots that are higher than three dimensions? I haven't found even one person yet. OK, so we're not going to plot it, obviously. But maybe we'll do some kind of computational thing with it. And then we'll have something that's called curse of dimensionality, which means that as you increase the number of variables, your calculations on the computer are almost always going to be slower there are some things that you can say, OK, I'll expect it to be linear or something like that to help yourself. But it's not a smart idea. And as Athena said in the lecture before this one, there are different models how to reduce your data set to only those that are really important. Also, sometimes you measure things with error or noise. And basically, you have one dimension more which is only about noise. This should have been like this. But obviously, you made a mistake here and here and here. OK. So if you remove that mistake, that's the part from those models that Athena was speaking about, that epsilon, epsilon, that measurement error. So it looks like 2D. But 
it is indeed only 1D with a bit of a measurement error, and you just want to discard that. Okay, with two-dimensional spaces, it's quite easy, but what to do with higher-dimensional spaces? We'll start our introduction with some linear algebra and some, something about matrices. First thing, what is a matrix? A mathematician would say that it's, it is a function going from here to there, but for you, it's just another representation of the data. So you can have columns, you can have rows, and you're going to put your data there. For example, this is like an Excel spreadsheet, or LibreOffice spreadsheet, if you like it like that. So you're going to have ID. This is the ID of the, I don't know, patient. And then you have his age, gender, creatinine levels, or something like that. Then you're going to have your data. So you can imagine it like a matrix, right? This is a matrix. It's some kind of rectangular structure that has some nice properties. And the properties are basically that you can do addition with matrices. How? You're going to just combine two elements on the same spot. So if you say that C is equal to A plus B, it means that C with E row and your column is going to be A in the same spot plus B at the same spot. Also, you can multiply matrices with regular, we call it scalars, but it's, for you it's just a regular, like, real number. How do you do that? You do it element-wise. So you just say, I'm going to multiply every element in my matrix with a fixed scalar, that alpha. You can also do transposition. So you, it's just like you have a matrix which is one, two, three, four, and you just imagine that one here and then transpose it to something like one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is equal to this transpose. You can multiply matrices. This is, it's not that intuitive, but if you're math student that you know something about linear operators so it becomes much more intuitive. The idea is that if you're going to have a matrix here and here, so you're going to take, for example, E row in your column and then you're going to take the first element and the first element, multiply them, get something and you're going to use second element and second element, multiply them and then you're going to get, for example, something times B plus something, times D, and so on. And you're going to get another matrix. Okay. With matrices, we can represent some structures, as I've shown before, which live in higher dimensional spaces. If you imagine columns as some vectors in high, higher dimensional space, then you're just living in a higher dimensional space, but you're representing your data in a matrix form. Okay, so about vectors in higher dimensional space, we could ask a question like this. If we have three points, is there a straight line which connects all three points? Okay. Or, if you have three points like this, is there a straight line that connects them? And then we're going to have a definition like this. A set of n-dimensional vectors are said to be linearly independent if none of them can be written as a linear combination of the others. So the idea is here, that's like basic calculus, you need only two points to derive an equation for your line. And then this point can be obtained from that equation because you derive the equation from these two points. It's linearly dependent. Okay. This is mathematical notation. It says that if you have an equation like this, it should be zero if and only if this is the truth. What does it mean if and only if? It means if you take this as a truth, you're going to get this as a result. And also, if you take this 
as the truth, you're going to get this as a result. Okay. Now we know what linear independence is. Now we can define something with matrices. We can define something that's called rank. So we can say that the rank of a matrix is, matrix, matrix is a number of linearly independent columns in a matrix. I said before, if you imagine columns as points in vector, like vectors in space, then what you're interested about, for example, if this point is the first column in your matrix, matrix and this is the second one and this is the third one you're interested if they lie on the same line basically you say okay if my rank is equal to three they do not lie on the same line but if my rank is below three some of the columns is linearly dependent on others which means we can represent that one with others so we have rank lower than the full it's going to be lower than 3. It's something like correlation. Okay. Something like correlation. The thing is that you can define it also as a number of linearly independent rows in a matrix. And the beauty of mathematics is that it is the same number. Okay. So it really doesn't, it's really of no importance to you. Now we need to define something that's, how do you define orthogonality? You define it with a formula like here, but for you in normal, real Euclidean spaces, it means that the angle is 90%. You have right angle here. This is orthogonal, but we write it like this. Okay, so if you multiply two vectors, so this is just another notation for this here. You've seen it already in Athena's lectures. If you get zero, they're orthogonal. It means they have right angle between them. We're also going to define something else. So how do we know that a vector in our space, what is his length? For example, this one. We're going to do it with norm. We're going to define something that's called the Euclidean norm. And you will already seen this in your first year in, at the university. So basically, you define norm as the square root of the sum of the squares. Does it look similar to something from Lasso or Ridge? Does it? Basically, in Lasso and Ridge, you have something like this. You define it as a sum, as a square root, not the square root, as a sum of something minus mean value, right? So basically, you're looking the distance from the mean. Now we, have, now we have defined norm, which means the length of the vector, of our point, how far is it from the zero. And we have defined the distance between any two vectors, any two points in the space. Can we do the same thing for matrices? How can we define the length of, the, of a matrix, right? So the question is, we would like to have it some similar properties to the guy up there. And people said, OK, it might be the easiest to just add another sum here so we can sum through rows and columns, take all the elements, square them, then take the square root, and we go and call that Frobenius norm. Of course, mathematicians need to prove that this is really a norm. For you, it really is a norm. And it's called Frobenius matrix norm. OK, now in, with matrices, we have norm. What do you think? How, how can we define distance between two matrices? Look at the definition up there. So you define the norm, and then you define distance between x and y as the length between x minus y. I mean, the length of x minus y. You could do the same thing for matrices, right? You could basically do the same thing. We had orthogonality, and we know when two vectors are orthogonal. What is orthogonal matrix? An orthogonal matrix is a square matrix with real entries. Who, when I say real entries, it means it's not a complex value. It's just your regular real number. Whose columns and rows are orthogonal unit vectors. What does it mean? If you have a matrix here, 
and you take this guy here and this guy here and then you check if they're orthogonal and you do that by sum of what products of elements as before as here and then if you get zero yeah but one more thing you see that i at the end that means identity matrix that's a matrix that has zeros here, 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 and once on the diagonal. So the idea is that you're going to have everything orthogonal except that guy with himself. You cannot be orthogonal with yourself. Let's say you cannot be orthogonal with yourself. If you're trying to see what it is, that's a norm, basically. And you're trying to say that's a unit norm. Your length of your vector is going to be 1. Okay. That was, that's, what, that's basically what it means to be orthogonal. So if you're not used to this, this basically means that y transpose times x, or more correctly, y transpose times y. And that's this. So if you do it like this, you get i, you have something that's called orthogonal matrix. Okay, now we can continue. We can continue with SVD. We have everything we need, so we can say what the SVD is. If you have any arbitrary matrix, say, in up there, you can just read it with real numbers inside. M is going to be the number of rows, and N is going to be the number of columns. Then you know that there exists something that's called decomposition of that matrix into three parts. So every matrix A can be written as a matrix U times matrix S tilde, and we said that we know how to multiply matrices, right? Times V transposed. So what's the beauty there? Nothing yet, but we know something else about U, V and S. We know that you can choose U to be orthogonal you can choose V to be orthogonal, and you can choose S to be diagonal. And when I say diagonal, basically zeros here, zeros here, and some numbers here. If they are all ones, we call that identity matrix, but it can be any other number, right? And as I said, U, V are orthogonal matrices. Matrix S is a diagonal matrix, so you write it like this sometimes. Sigma 1 to sigma r, they're just numbers. S tilde is basically a big matrix. It's just that it's got only r components on the diagonal that are different from 0. So that, that is the reason why it's written like this. You have r elements here on the diagonal which are different than 0. These guys on the diagonal, they're called singular values they're all greater than zero and you can make a decomposition in which you're going to get the first guy bigger than the second guy and so on in decreasing order okay the number this number r must be lower than m and n because this guy here is m times n or not it depends it does it depend I'm going to leave it for exercise if you want to do it. And as I said, these are singular values. OK, so the idea here is that that R is basically the rank of a matrix. So you could define a rank of a matrix just by doing this decomposition, trying to see how many on the diagonal are different from 0. OK. It's the same thing as linearly independent rows or columns. If you have a triplet like this, you call that SVD. SVD, singular value decomposition. Okay. The first R columns of U, U are called left, and from V they're called right, singular vectors of A, and they satisfy this thing here. A times VI is equal to sigma i times ui. It's just that they satisfied 
and that's it basically. And also they satisfy ui transpose times a as a matrix is equal to sigma i equal to vi. And now when you see something like this, it doesn't seem that interesting, right? If you come from a mathematical background, for you any type of a result when you can do matrix decomposition, decomposition is sexy. But for other people, this is just like, okay, too many maths here, right? There comes more maths here, but this, this is really important. So it's really important for you to try to understand what happens here. Let F be some matrix written in the USV transpose. We said before that you can decompose any matrix into that, right? But that's basically SVD factorization of matrix F. And matrices U, S and V can be expressed, expressed as follows. So you have matrix U. You can take some columns and generate a new matrix. For example, first R columns. And from the last columns, R plus 1 to N, you can call it U2. Okay. So basically, from one matrix, you can create two matrices just by choosing different columns. You can do the same thing here and here. Just take the first R elements, the first R columns and first R rows. Then you can define the new matrix, which is basic, basically U1 times S1 times V1 transposed. Okay. So the difference here is that these guys here, they have lower dimension because you choose only some columns from here and some columns from here. And this matrix is a smaller matrix. And the most important, one of the most important theorems in applied numerical algebra comes here. This means that if you're going to minimize this guy here, and we said this is the distance, Frobenius distance between f minus, between f and f hat, over all f hats such that they have rank lower than k. Sorry, so you would choose u1 with k columns and v1 with k columns. So if you're looking in a space of rank all the matrices which have linearly independent rows or columns such that there are at most k of them, then you know that this matrix is the solution. Okay, so what does it really mean? It means that if you want to get from a big space to a lower space and you want to do that without losing too much information. Basically, this, this here is how much information are you going to lose? Then you can do it with SVD by taking just k columns of u1, v1, and the first k elements on the diagonal of S. Okay, I'll make a pause here so you can think about it. This is a really important thing. You're going to see this in, in a lot of articles, they're going to call it eigengenes or eigenvalues or eigenarrays. If you're going to do networks and you're going to use something from guys like Steve Horvath or somebody like that, then they're always going to try to reduce the dim dimension and they're almost always going to use SVD for that. So the reason why you can use SVD is because you have a mathematical theorem that says that there is nobody who is better in the approximation of F than the guy that is created by the SVD. And not only that, you can also say how good it is. If you remember those sigmas, those were the elements on the diagonal of S, right? And you took the first K. So what stays here is basically your error. 
If you take more of them, the error will be lower, right? If you take all of them, there is no error. If you take only one, then you need, you need to sum everything on that all, square it, square root, except the first one, and then you're going to say, I've reduced my really, really big space to only one dimension, and I made an error that big. This matrix, which is created by SVD and minimizes norm here, basically there, is unique. If and only if sigma k is different than sigma k plus 1. This, re this really isn't that important for you. But you should know that sometimes you can get more different solutions. So this matrix can be rewritten, let's just say it like that. If these guys are equal. But if they're different, then this is the only matrix that can minimize this norm here, like the closest one in lower space. OK. Do you have any questions regarding this? It's going to take you some time to, to go through it and, and make it familiar with yourself. But basically, this is the only thing that really is important, this here, telling that's the best thing you can do. An example. So, we have microarrays, and some guys studied tumors in six types of tissues, with tissue. There were 44 tissue samples and 46 microarray slides. What happened to them? They switched from one instrument to another instrument in the middle of the experiment. So, basically, the first 26 slides have some spots, and the Next, 20 slides have more because they changed the instrument. Five of the samples were done on both 22K and 42K platforms. Okay, so they can check for the error and such things. 7,425 spots were in common to both platforms, had good signal across all slides, and had sample variance above a certain threshold. That's like quality checking, let's say. The results were represented as 7, 2, 4, 5 times 46 matrix. Basically rows times columns. These are slides here. And we can plot a picture that you usually see if you read scientific literature. We can plot something like this here. Seven, around 7,000 genes and 46 slides, basically arrays. Green means negative expression level, red means positive expression level, and now you try to find something in that, some kind of a connection or something. And then what you, what, what you can do, you can just recognize, okay, this is a matrix, right? Maybe I have noise here, maybe not everything is important. Why don't I just do SVD? This is SVD, this is basically your U, your S, which is diagonal, black thing means zero. So only diagonal, and if you see, it's the brightest in the upper corner, because that's the biggest value. We said in SVD you can order it by in decreasing order. So here you, you almost see nothing. And then you have that V transpose. So what they did, they called columns of this matrix eigenarrays and rows of this matrix eigengenes. So if you read scientific literature in the past maybe three or four years, you're going to see eigengenes. Eigengenes are rows of this here matrix. Okay. Using the data that they have and using the SVD decomposition, they've reduced matrix to 5,520 times 46. Basically, what they did, what they think, what they did, they said we're going to cut off somewhere, make a smaller space, we're not going to lose that much information, and have a smaller matrix, and we are going to think that we removed noise, right? And they, they did classification of certain types of tumors with the obtained matrix, 
which is basically a result of the SVD, and they got some really nice results. Okay, this is the introduction to SVD. Now we continue. We already mentioned variants. Yeah. Can you go back uh, to the images? So, I mean, an eigen array or an eigen gene. So does that mean? I mean, normally with eigen vectors, I think of orthogonal vectors uh, building up others based on these basis vectors. How do I think of that in terms of eigen array? So some of the okay, okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not about eigen arrays that much. They've left 46 there, right? Yeah. It's about eigengenes more. Mm -hmm. So what you could do is basically this. You could say, I have huge high dimensional data, which comes from different genes. And then I'm gonna do clustering or something like that to take, for example, these guys here to A and these guys here to B. And then from A, I'm going to do SVD and get this. So I cannot work with everything. For example, I have only 300 samples and I have maybe 20,000 columns. So what I want to do is I want to get a good representative of like cluster of genes. So basically you're going to change all the columns by all the rows here by one row which is going to be the guy who's going to represent that whole cluster of genes in your calculations later. So what, that's what they do. And if you do something like clustering before, then you can be at least guys from UCLA that say so. So one needs to believe them. They're like the best university in the world, they say. So you can be sure that you're going to get with even one vector that the first thing is going to explain 80 to 90 percent of the variation inside. Okay, it's, so it's not about eigenarrays, it's more about eigengenes. Are there any more questions regarding this? Yes, yes, please. But you're now in reduced space, so maybe basically you've done projections. It's quite hard to do so. It's like taking a can of cola, which is a 3D, and then just stepping on it. It's going to stay circular up, but then you're going to lose all the red and such things on the sides of the picture. And going up, you destroy definitely something, because you already stepped on it and just trying to, to get it up, you lose something. It's not that easy. Any more questions? Okay. So let's go back to variance. Variance of a random variable is given. You know this basically because Janine told you about this and everybody told you about variance. Is like a measure of spread. How far you are from your mean. You can also define sample variance, basically an estimator of the variance in this sense, where these guys are re realizations of the random variable x. And with x overline, basically, I miss here xi, not n. This is arithmetic mean. Okay, you've seen this already. You've already seen covariance. I'm just going to go through it quickly. So covariance between two different random variables is given with expectation and something here, difference between x and its mean times y and its mean. You can also define sample covariance in a similar manner as with variance. And it is, it is quite easy to see that if you take covariance of same variables, you're going to get variance in the end because if, the, if these guys are same, then it's just squared here, and that's it, basically. Okay. How can you define something like variance for big data sets? How can you define variance for, I don't know, 10 variables, 15 variables together? Because if you're going to look 
in high dimensional spaces you're going to have many variables and then you want to have something that says something about how far you are from something like let's call it mean in high dimensions you can do something like that with a structure called covariance or covariance variance matrix where you basically say okay I have many variables let's call them x1 to xn I'm just gonna put them all in one vector called x and then I'm gonna define various covariance structure of that x and go, I'm gonna call it sigma as a matrix that is consistent of on diagonal it's variance of every element of the vector and otherwise if you're on the if row then it's gonna be covariance for example I'm here at row number two then it's gonna be covariance x2 over the index of the column which is one covariance between x2 and x1 okay you're gonna see sigmas also if you do statistics and high dimensional data a lot so this is a nice 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 representative of variance in high dimensions also sigma can be represented in the terms of the original x this isn't quite correct but okay so it can be represented yeah this is x transpose times x and you, you just need to divide by n minus one if you're doing sample covariance or something like that if you're doing estimates so when you see sigma you can think about x transpose times x I believe that some of you have already seen this if you did some literature scanning basically most of the mathematicians write covariance matrix like this not not as sigma no 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 no, 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 no. Let, let it stay like this I'm going to correct uh, I'm not sure if I need n minus one there but I should I believe I need it so the question is what if we could separate our points in space based on that new variance structure not just on measuring distance between points but taking into account different interactions of different variables it could be useful right and we can do that but first we need to introduce some things basically if we do something like that we're going to call it PCA principal component analysis and it's going to consist of orthogonality between different vectors and the idea of splitting by variance there is a great paper introduction paper to SVD and PCA basically to PCA by Jonathan or Jonathan I'm not sure and he starts his paper with principal component analysis is a standard tool in modern data analysis in, the, in diverse fields from neuroscience to computer graphics because it is a simple non-parametric method for extracting relevant information from confusing data sets with minimal effort PCA provides a roadmap for how to reduce a complex data set to a lower dimension to reveal the sometimes hidden simplified structures that often underlie it as you see he's like saying okay guys if you do exploratory analysis please use PCA start with PCA please so let's go back how how can we separate by variance so what we would like is to find orthogonal axes so that we maximize explained variance why orthogonal it's easier from a mathematical point of view then you can use different matrix decompositions to derive a solution there are different approaches one of them is called ICA which means independent component analysis I'm not going to talk about it but people use it now a lot and it works quite well so the idea here is to say okay I've got some points for example the, these points what I want to do is basically I want to try to change the axis here I'm going to try to find new axis so that they explain as much as possible variance my data has 
So what I would do here, I know that maybe this seems as the smartest thing because if you do a projection on this line of all the points, it seems like we conserved our variance in this direction, right? So this seems like the direction with most variance. And we can say, okay, this is the first principal component we have chosen. And then, since we need to do it in an orthogonal way, we can take another axis. And I think that you only have two options in 2D, which is basically one option. And you take new axis like this. And then you say to yourself, okay, let's see, the first axis, its spread is like this big and it looks really nice. If you look at the second axis and you project everything onto second axis, everything is going to be here, right? So we have something that's this big and something that's this big. So we can say, okay, this seems like 80% of the explained variance and this seems like 20% of the explained variance. And then if you're not afraid to reuse dimensions, then you can say, okay, I'm just going to ignore this guy here. I'm just going to use everything that is basically projected onto this line and I've reduced my dimensions. Excellent. And I think I basically destroyed the noise in my data. I must say that it's quite often that you also destroy valuable things like additional information and so on, but you can never know because you cannot see in 117 dimensions. So. This is basically the only thing you can do to plot it to see it with your eyes. So here, what I've done is I've just chosen one dimension. What you can do with 100 dimensions, you can reduce it to two or three, which we're going to do here in maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then plot it in two or three dimensions just to see it, rotate it, see how it behaves. Maybe you see something there because you're not able to see 100 dimensions, right? Okay. As I said, the idea is to choose a unit vector. A unit vector just means that this guy here is going to be of the length one. You and project all of the points x, i, these guys, to a line through that unit vector, described by that vector. Naturally, you would like to choose u so it keeps as much I wrote here something that's not mathematical, but it makes more sense, diversity. You want to keep as much diversity as you can. And that's basically variance. Such U is called principal component. So this would be principal component number one, and this would be principal component number two, right? If the covariance matrix of the original data was sigma, then covariance matrix of the projected data will be given with Something like this, u transpose times sigma times u. As sigma is symmetric, the unit vector u, which maximizes the new covariance structure, is nothing but the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. OK, so these eigenvalues and this guy called eigenvector, just for now, don't confuse them with these guys. Okay. So what are eigenvectors and eigenvalues? From a mathematical perspective, if you have some matrix A, which means you're... So matrix A represents some kind of operator from... that's going to take one point and go to another point. And what you say here is, is there something, some V, which basically can be completely described by scalar multiplication. So if you have a point like this in some kind of operator, so, sorry, this doesn't work quite well. Is there something that would just prolong it or something like that? That means multiplying with a scalar. scalar. So, if there is something like that, those Vs are called eigenvectors, and that lambda is called eigenvalue. So here, 
we see that the solution, which basically is the principal component number one, is eigenvector of our matrix. And if you do something like that, if you get eigenvectors and eigenvalues, then we can say that just doing something like this, principal components, that we explain some kind of variance and it is completely given by this formula, which says if you took first our principal components and these are the appropriate eigenvalues for those principal components, eigenvectors, then the, po the proportion of the variance you explain is given by this fraction. So you take the first R, sum it, and divide it by the whole thing. If the dimensions are highly correlated, which means if the things are highly correlated, like here, would you say that this is highly correlated? I would say yes. Then you're really lucky. Because doing principal component analysis, as we've seen, can reduce the dimensionality of your data. But sometimes you have data that is like this. So, what would be the first principal component? What would be the second principal component? Let's just say the first one is this one, the second one is this one. They explain around the same variation, right? So basically, if the dimensions are not correlated, Okay, here, I, it could be they're correlated because it looks some kind of a circle. I don't know, just add more things randomly here. It's quite hard to be a random number generator, but okay. So if the dimensions are not correlated, R, the thing you choose here, the first R principal components, will be as large as M. Sorry, that should be N. You cannot choose one principal component here without losing a lot of information. So basically, you're not that lucky. There's, you're not going to do dimensional reduction. Okay. Do you have any questions regarding this? Does this mean that we should be normalizing our data? Because in that case, if there is no correlation, then the, the variable that has the most variance. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was thinking to introducing that in practicals, but you should center it and standardize it or something. So if you measure things in units like millimeters or units like centimeters or units like, I know, meters, kilometers, you always take, have to take such things into account when you explore your data and everything. Yeah, it's quite important. And now we get to the relation between SVD and PCA. So PCA, before PCA was done by something that's called eigen decomposition. Nowadays, it's almost always done by SVD. And how? So if e, since sigma is a real symmetric matrix, it can be expressed, matrix and it should be changed, using SVD factorization as sigma equal to V S squared V transposed. Okay, this is strange. You haven't seen this. It looks like magic, but it's not magic. It's just that if you take, take the original X here and write it as USV transpose, this is single value de decomposition, then your sigma, which is basically, if you multiply it with N minus one, it's X transposed X. So if you use all the things I mentioned before and a bit, of, bit more knowledge about matrix theory, then you have USV T transposed times USVT. And if you do transposition on this guy here, so it changes order and does transposition on the every element. So V come, becomes the first one. V transpose transposed is V. S stays the second one. So you have S transpose, but since S is a diagonal matrix, nothing is going to change. And then you have U transpose. It comes here. But we said, it should be U here, sorry. It, here, this be u. So we said if you have u transposed and u, since u is orthogonal, it's going to be identity. It's going to be one, basically. So you just lose this guy here and get v s squared v transposed. And this is something that's called eigen decomposition. And there is some knowledge in math that 
from the eigen decomposition you can get your eigenvalues and from here you can see that eigenvalues are co correlated not only correlated they're just the pro something from the singular values so basically SVD is completely connected with PCA you can do it in two ways R has many functions but two functions basically one so you can stay consistent with S plus which does it by eigen value decomposition and the other which does it by SVD and today SVD has much more numerical precision than I think it's still like that than eigen value de decomposition so you should use the one that uses SVD and that's why when you did SVD up there here they call it eigenarrays and eigenvalues from that formula I showed later eigenvectors are columns of this guy here basically and eigenvalues are here in this matrix if this, your, if this is the original X matrix basically I have some references these are all online papers web pages or presentations the first one is the one that you should definitely start reading if you're interested into this the second one here there are good slides here I like stack exchange a lot so you can find like a lot of really nice answers there Wikipedia always and those pictures I've shown from eigen genes and eigen arrays they come from this site here.